and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe podcast and video. Uh, I am David Bonson. I'm the managing partner and chief investment officer at the Bonson Group. And I'm recording in the middle of the trading day, actually dead middle, uh, right smack at the halfway point of Friday's trading session and ready to call it a week in markets. If things were to close right now, we'd end up down on the week a little bit, not, not very much. You had a very big up day on Monday, a more muted down day Tuesday, but then a big down day Wednesday, and then a pretty good up day on uh, Thursday. And then we were kind of flat down a little uh, uh, to start off today, Friday. As I'm talking now, we've gone down 400 points. Um, so 400 is traditionally a lot of volatility. These days it is not. But my point being, the market may end up this week, um, it probably won't end up flat. It'll end up down, but not, not violently. So, so take that for whatever you wish. You know, actually, let me address that. It, it is something to address as far as what the short-term expectations are, which are for us, none. Like we don't have an expectation. We're living in the uncertainty of the moment that week by week, um, we feel that our client portfolios need to be positioned for the fact that equities could drop a lot and equities could rally a lot. And there is not a um, logical reason or a technical reason, a predictable reason um, around it being one or the other. Uh, that's true in every single week, but some may not know that, some may not believe that, but they're wrong. On uh, any given week, that uncertainty is why one has to have an asset allocation that fits their investment objectives, and they have to have the discipline to be able to stick to it. And, and that became very hard, obviously, over the last month because of the, the challenges that existed in markets and the ongoing uncertainty that exists around the coronavirus um, pandemic. And so we sit here, I suppose, a couple weeks further into the uncertainty, um, therefore a couple weeks closer to it coming to an end. But at the same time, um, the uncertainty is is still very real and 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 unfortunately um there's not a real clarity as to when exactly that will be going away there is a lot of positive data out there I, i'm sharing a lot of the health information um i as i get it with 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 a lot of you but uh you know when the national shutdown of american enterprise is going to come to an end and that will be the point at which markets uh, fall off. I'm assuming people know that, that whether we end up with the really best case scenario of mortality around coronavirus, which is a very low number, or, or some of the higher numbers that have been thrown out there, which are, which are awful from a human standpoint, but that most certainly either, either side of those things is not what the market's responding to. The market's responding to the treatment, not the virus directly. The, the treatment being the shutdown of the American economy. And again, others can debate you know, what the policy response has been and what the good or bad and, and all that is. My only point is that from an investment standpoint and a financial standpoint, the, the um, ultimate end run here is for the American economy to reopen for business. And, and most assuredly, we understand that that is juxtaposed with the healthcare reality. But at the end of the day, the ability for American business to get back to business is what will drive some clarity around um, economic recovery. And, and so that debate about a V-shape versus a U-shape recovery, about some uh, third quarter improvement versus fourth quarter, um, the, you know, those things remain totally open-ended. And uh, frankly, I'm exhausted by reading some of the analysis of these things because people are making predictions based on um, hypotheticals that are made up out of thin air. Like you cannot possibly forecast with any reasonable or fundamental foundation fourth quarter economic metrics without uh, a starting point as to when the, the pandemic shutdown ends and, and what exactly the violence of the moment kind of becomes. Economically, the, the stimulus package is right now, as I'm talking, the Paycheck Protection Program, which is the $350 billion facility to support small business with forgivable loans, companies under 500 employees getting up to $10 million of money they will not have to pay back if they keep their payrolls intact, um, two and a half times their average monthly payroll. 
that program has been open for a grand total of three hours now. Uh, I'm actually surprised uh, the data, and again, this will be different by the time you're hearing this. They funded in the first few hours 889 loans so far. Um, excuse me, I may have, wait, 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 I think I'm giving you the wrong number. Let me do this right. Um, you know, I've closed it out. I believe it was $889 million at 2,800 loans. So forgive me, I, I mixed up the two numbers. And, and again, that's just rapidly going higher by the minute here. Will they end up with a backlog? Will there end up being reports of, of bureaucratic slowdowns and processing delays? I would imagine we'll see. Um, but the point being, companies have all the way to the end of June to be funded on these loans to apply. And obviously, most people are trying to get cash right away. So we expect some slowdown there, but I, I don't know how you predict fourth quarter recovery when you don't know how second quarter mitigation efforts are gonna go, not just health-wise, but I mean economically. Um, not to mention other programs around, around the stimulus. The Fed is still kind of getting up and running with some of their facilities. You're seeing improvement where they've begun to intervene in some aspects of capital markets. Uh, other areas still appear dislocated, so. This is the environment we're in. My motive in, in very heavy amounts of communication right now is purely to serve my clients and to inform them as to our thinking, to provide uh, adequate amounts of information for their own digestion, um, to share our analysis and conclusions. What the motive is not is to somehow suggest that there is kind of a secret sauce or, or a kind of secret code someone's gonna crack in timing all of these things perfectly. There's reasonably well-known variables, and what I mean by well-known is uh, the, what those variables that are not known are. We know what those things are. We, we just don't know what, what their you know, solution will end up being, what, uh, how they'll, they'll play out. But this is the point I would make. The unpredictability of the moment is both the risk and the opportunity, and that's basically true always but it is more true now to the degree that the uh, downside of uh, various bad news and the upside of various good news is higher. You know, we're now looking at one to 2% up and down days as low volatility days, so that's just insane. Um, I've commented a lot over the last few years that in 2017, we went all year without even a 3% drop. And now we basically are having something near that happen on a daily basis. And, and we've had way too many days up and down that were far more even than that in, in the last few weeks. Um, when I look into uh, dividendcafe.com, which I have open on my screen right now, I'm still kind of completing writing it, but I needed to get the recording going first. Um, I do think there's a lot of information there, a lot of charts that are really useful. Um, the flows into cash out of other assets in the month of March are staggering. You can look at it as bad news, which it is in hindsight, like it describes the bad news that was. You can look at it as good news, which it is, because it describes the opportunity that will be both those sentences I just said are accurate. Neither one of them, uh, excuse me, the past one comes with a timeline by definition, but the future one does not. But 680, uh, excuse me, $658 billion went into cash in the month of March, 284 billion of it, nearly half coming out of bond funds. Um, from 156 billion out of investment grade, high quality corporate bonds, 47 billion out of emerging market bonds. I commented uh, a week or so ago when it was a hedge fund manager of ours who shared that with me that I didn't even know there was that much money in emerging market bonds, US investors. So the, um, the outflows are significant in speech to the dislocations we were living through in the middle of March and into the late end, later end of March. Um, and yet uh, all of that money on the sideline at some point in time becomes a coiled spring and, and of course, timing of that is, is not our objective. Um, I want to provide a bit of reminder, the, the sort of mentality of I'd like to wait to buy stocks till things are better, it's very understandable emotionally. It's not very um, cogent mathematically, but that's okay. A lot of times emotions 
have to trump uh, math and logic. But I put in a chart this week from uh, Yale. Uh, Bob Bob Schiller had a had a really interesting um, graphic of the modeling of monies that were averaged into equities over the last ten years. And a dollar you put in in 2010 versus a dollar you put in in 2015, what those dollars are worth now. And it's really not rocket science to suggest that the most profitable um, dollars invested 10 years ago, let's say, uh, were, are the ones that were done at the lowest level of prices. Now, I mean, really what I'm saying here is a tautology. It's in and of itself true. The lower price you paid, the more money that was made, obviously, in the, in the future. But the reason I bring it up, and I think it is somewhat confusing for people, is that um, in the moment of distress, not with the gift of hindsight, the intuition is often, I would like to invest when things are better. And, and so I think people have to kind of get comfortable with which side of this they want to be on to the degree there is money that within a prudent and properly constructed asset allocation plan that needs to be invested. One has to consider if the kind of current level emotions and, and obsessing over the nightly news versus the, the intuitive math and logic of, of buying lower, not higher, um, it, it, to feed longer term investment objectives makes more sense. I don't have a, uh, a dog in that, in that fight of trying to um, force anybody to invest money that they're not comfortable investing, that, that you have to sleep at night. But you have to also make decisions with the full um, orbit of information and perspective, and that's what we're attempting to do. Um, let me kind of move around a few other categories today. Uh, I'm, I'm increasingly intrigued by how this entire es escapade is affecting Europe. And, and I don't just mean the health data in Italy um, and then Spain and then France, which are the three kind of worst countries. I don't really know why the picture is so much better in Scandinavia and even in Germany and Holland. Um, but it clearly is, and I'm sure that there could be either medical or demographic or geographical or climate or any kind of other issues as to why the, the data and the impact has been more severe in some pockets versus others. But allow me just to say that the um, economic aspect and cultural aspect I think is going to become one of these issues that we address later on uh, on, on and maybe a more normalized aspect of post-COVID uh, uh, thinking. The, the fact of the matter is that the European Union um, is, right now centers on a currency that is shared. And in a moment like this, the um, trading cross-border, uh, the various legal differentials country to country, they all speak to a very fragmented European Union. They all speak to the individual sovereignty of the countries. And it just does kind of beg the question what the shared currency is doing for any of them. Um, if in a global health pandemic, uh, you're functionally completely on your own as a country anyways, then why suffer through the cost of this uh, quasi-unionization? And I, I intend to really study that all the way through um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of skip over some of the things I talk about at DividendCafe.com this week around bond spreads, but there are some charts and some explanations that I think are important. I have been very um, careful to not let up on the topic of what's happening in the fixed income markets um, because for one thing, a, a focus only on equity markets doesn't serve my clients well because you know, equities only represent about half of our total business. For some clients, it's less than half. Some, it's a bit more than half. But, you know, we're very diversified and asset allocated investors. And so, therefore, I think it's important that we maintain a lot of information, a lot of understanding around the bond market and around alternatives um, that feed a lot of the investor outcomes in both short and long term timelines. But also, it speaks to the entire high-level um, uh, apparatus that we're in um, when liquidity goes away, when there are dislocations in certain markets, when you see evidence of panic 
not just in stocks where it's very common, but in other arenas. And we've talked a lot about like municipal bonds, for example. Um, I also think it's important to understand these things in the context of where the Fed is intervening and where they're not. We already can see where the Fed has come in to the AAA RMBS market, residential mortgage backed um, you, you see dislocations almost entirely go away. The Fed was able to become that buyer, stabilize that market. In the non-agency CMBS market, so commercial mortgage-backed securities that don't have any sort of government connectivity, those markets remain highly disconnected. And so it's important for us to be able to see where there's liquidity and efficiency versus where there isn't. And, and the central bank right now is more or less the tiebreaker uh, on those various tension points. And that both captures the description of the moment, but it also provides some forward-looking guidance as we wrap our arms around what the Fed intends to be doing into the future. Um, there's a, not lengthy, but a, a little bit of an elaboration at Dividend Cafe around something I think is very important, particularly for those of you that are more opportunistic right now in recognizing some of the dislocations in capital markets, especially in credit and fixed income. Um, and we call it a toast to illiquidity, but what I mean by that is the, the liability that daily liquidity can represent for certain investments. When an investor has the right to redeem their assets on, on a daily basis, that's thought of as a benefit to an investor, but when there's leverage in the underlying asset and managers all of a sudden face required daily redemptions, that negative feedback loop of having to sell at lower assets, which creates lower prices, which creates more sales and redemptions, which creates lower prices still, rinse and repeat. And yet the benefit of illiquidity with assets that have that sort of capital risk is tremendous because you can at least avoid the self-fulfilling prophecy of leverage spiraling, of leverage finance going into negative feedback loop. And, and so we want to really assert illiquidity in those types of um, asset classes that, that most require it. Um, where there is leverage, uh, we want it to be smart and prudent, we, not risky and, and excessive. Um, but then fundamentally, even when, apart from the technical framework we want in bonds, alternatives, you really want um, w underwriting that matters. It's something we talked about at the beginning of the year, well before the coronavirus blow up, that the fundamental bottom-up realities, they don't matter in a given day like some of the days you saw in the middle of March where markets were just uh, uh, swooning. Um, but they matter fundamentally uh, that in the long run, these assets will be priced according to their actual intrinsic value. And that intrinsic value is a derivative of the quality of the asset, the uh, cash flow, and the, perpet the perpetuity of payment. That's where underwriting matters. And so I just want to reinforce that understanding as we as credit investors, whether being opportunistic or defensive, that we take seriously the technical framework and, and the fundamental strength of the underlying assets. Historically, we've already talked about this before, but a chart reinforcing the 22 days it took for the market to go from its high to down over 30% was the fastest in history. Um, as far as daily losses, Two of the worst 10 days in, in market history were just a few days apart from each other in the middle of March. Um, and, and so that historical framework of what exactly has taken place, uh, again, accentuated by the national margin call of the middle of March and the uncertainty of the moment. Um, a lot of those technical pressures have been alleviated, not completely. I have no, I continue to have, I wanna say this, I have no opinion as to whether or not we retest the lows that the market saw a couple weeks back in March. I don't um, believe that it's assured that we will. The arguments for the fact that markets always retest lows are really kind of stupid because they presuppose what those lows necessarily were at the, at the time. Um, the market did not retest the lows of March 6, 2009. And, and so again, you, there are low points along the way to finding a bottom that sometimes double hit, but you just simply don't know that one, something was a bottom until you get to look back in history. 
And all I can tell you is that there are scenarios where I could see the market dropping again um, around uncertainty and bad news and other things in the, in the days and weeks ahead. And there are scenarios where I could see more 2,000 point, uh, 3,000 point moves higher. So um, our view has to be agnostic about the day by day and week by week and even you know for the month of April, that, that type of timeline. Our, our view has to be focused on where we are on a post-COVID uh, moment. And what I mean by post-COVID is not everything completely out of the woods, but at least that scenario by which the curve isn't bent and there is a really strong national push to reignite American enterprise. At that point, we are not going back to the economy and the jobs data that we were at the beginning of January. Um, what, what I do believe will happen is that we'll have a much better environment and a little more clarity as to what forward earnings can end up being, which right now no such clarity exists. So you have some level at which markets, Lord willing, are, will be much higher than they are now, but nowhere near back to where they were. And then you have that kind of grind of getting uh, economic recovery going, either V-shape or U-shape. And, and um, that, to me, is the big uncertainty as to where the end of 2020 will go. Uh, what I do believe is it will be significantly better than it is in the heat of the moment where we don't know what the New York shutdown will look like, what we don't know what the rest of the country shutdown will look like. And, and so much of America right now is not able to go to work and certainly not able to consume. So the brutal jobs numbers, the brutal uh, unemployment claims, all those things are there. Uh, we'll have more information in a week. We'll have more information in, in two weeks and three weeks about the efficacy of what has been done in the stimulus program so far as cash works its way into the economy, into business owners, into employees' hands. Um, I, I, there's a lot of reasons I'd be optimistic about the effects of some of those things. Uh, we also are going to probably get more clarity on future ongoing programs. I don't think politically the phase four is going to be happening very easily, but I most certainly think there will end up being a phase four. But both sides probably are willing to fight out a phase four a little more than they were the phase three, which was the two trillion. Um, and so, you know, those things have to play themselves out. And then also the, the level of aggressiveness that the Fed brings to the table, um, the size of their facilities, their uh, willingness to go all in on supporting Treasury and mortgage-backed, high-quality mortgage-backed markets is surreal. Um, we, we know they're delving into the um, one- to five-year corporate bond space. We know they've already dived into the very short-term municipal bond space. But will there end up being a backstop into, let's say, some of the CLOs and levered loan market? Will there be a backstop into the non-agency CMBS uh, market, commercial mortgage back? Uh, I wouldn't bet against it. I, it isn't assured, though. So again, it's another uncertainty. But it makes it very difficult to have a strong conviction um, in short-term movements because the Fed could come in with some of these aggressive ideas uh, supporting the mortgage servicers, which has created a lot of uncertainty in financial markets, things like that, that, um, that just really changed the landscape. So that's our position right now. Um, we wait and see uh, around the health data, around the Fed, around the efficacy of the fiscal stimulus. And, and at that point, um, as the health data converts into something that gives us you know, a glimpse of the future, then you get to start doing some better fundamental analysis, re-weighting, re-rating, and reallocating. Right now, um, we are comfortable with the positions that we have. We, we are actively engaged in markets every day, and we certainly welcome any questions you may have about your own particular situation as we continue trying to guide our clients through all this. Uh, we live in interesting times. And I, I and every one of my partners, advisors, and colleagues stand uh, ready to help anyone we can. This is our job. Uh, we do thank you for listening to the Dividend Cafe. We thank you for reading uh, our commentary at DividendCafe.com. And, and as we all go through this together, please stay healthy, stay well, and why don't we all abide in faith and hope? Thank you for listening to the Dividend Cafe.